I think that we're still stuck in an idea that if we're outsourcing, that means we're getting lower quality work done rather than if I hired somebody local, then they've got to be better because they're here in person. And I think that's a huge misnomer. But you know, tell us your story. It's gotta be exciting when you have a lot, a lot of irons in the fire. Well, I don't know if there's a lot of irons in a good way or a bad way. Sometimes too much is too much. And, but I think I would get very bored if I didn't have a lot going on. It's just my personality. If there's chaos, Usually there's something good coming out of it. And so I definitely like a lot going on, but I mean, the history, how I got into entrepreneurship, I think is my real dad was a, a struggling entrepreneur. He never really kind of hit a home run and, and had anything that became very successful, but I understood what he was trying to do. On the flip side, my mom and my stepdad were both, you know, employees. You know, my stepdad was a police officer in a very underpaid jurisdiction and, and organization. And it was challenging. We didn't come from a poor, poor family, but we definitely didn't have the money to, you know, have extravagant or extra things. You know, it was a vacation once every decade or something. And I knew I just wanted more in my own life. And, you know, I, I was smart enough to see, we grew up in a small little farm town. The people who were entrepreneurs who owned the companies, their families, their kids, they all had the most money. And so it's like, it didn't take much for me to figure out that guy's got all the stuff. His kids have all the things that we wish we had how do I grow up to be like that guy? And so that was kind of the initial part of it. Then of course, as I got older and I was, you know, in high school, you know, I did well in school, but it wasn't really what I loved. It didn't want to go to school. I'd rather, you know, kind of build things, tinker, sell things, but I played sports. And so sports was the thing I just stayed hard in. And so that got me to school every day is because there was, you know, there was practice and there's games and so forth. But then of course, you know, like many, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that, one book I could probably give a ton of credit to because it clicked. For whatever reason, the understanding of how I wasn't taught about money, my parents obviously weren't taught about money, that by itself made me an entrepreneur if I wasn't gonna be one already. And so that was kind of how it kind of just started. And I read that book about eight times, you know, probably as I was a junior in high school, senior in high school, so yeah. Yeah. Any one particular thing that stood out mostly in that book? It's a, it's a great book. It's been out there for years. Well, the, the interesting part was, you know, you can either become somebody else's plan to wealth or you can become your own. Right. And so, you know, understanding because then, you know, you get into the cash flow quadrants and you understand the four different quadrants and you realize, yeah, if I were to, again, go back to who, who I looked up to as a kid, it's like that guy is a big business owner and the investor. He's not a doctor. He's not the attorney in town who works 80 hours a week and is stressed out of his mind and never sees his kids. That guy was coaching my baseball team. That guy was taking his son with me to baseball games in the middle of the week when everybody else was working. It was very clear that there was something different and the entrepreneurial side to build things and invest in things, that's where I wanted to, I wanted to get to. So what was your first, I know you had multiple companies yeah. today, but what was, your, what was your first company? Let's see, I dropped out of college to uh, start a door-to-door -door sales business. What were you selling? Widgets, name it. It's I mean, it could have been anything. It was everything from cutting boards to pots and pans to children's coloring books and toys. And the business that I got involved in was kind of a, you know, a marketing company front, right? It was, Hey, we're out, we're doing door-to-door -door sales. It's promotional sales. So it's marketing. And at the end of the day, it was literally just straight hardcore sales. And the company basically, it was a fantastic business model in the end. You could only get so far with it. Who wants to do door-to-door -door sales? Not everybody. But literally, we would go business to business, walk in, talk to the receptionist, and try to sell her whatever we had in our hands. And yeah, no appointment necessary, just you know, figure out how to close somebody. So that was huge because that got me comfortable hearing no all day long, every single day. And it's like, it doesn't phase me if somebody doesn't want to do business with us. And it hasn't since I was in my you know, early 20s. Um, so that was the company that I then hired a couple people, I got a product consignment, and then we grew that to 40 employees, and then I later sold the company. That, so that fueled you. You, you, had this, you read this book, you had this passion building up within you, you went out there and, and, and released some of that passion in the door-to-door -door sales business. Uh, 
sold that company, then what was, your, what was your next step after that? Well, I got into real estate. I took the little bit of earnings I got from the company because I didn't make a lot off of it. Probably didn't know what I was doing. I could have probably gotten more now that I'm in hindsight and understand business quite a bit better. I probably could have gotten a lot more money from that, but I took what I got and then I started buying, you know, just investment properties. It was in the boom in 2005, 2006, everything's hot. Real estate's the way to go. We were buying brand new construction homes and essentially go into a development, you know, where they're uh, building, you know, big, huge subdivisions. We would put a deposit on a couple houses in that same subdivision. By the time that they, you know, finished paving the driveway and called it good, you'd have equity in the property. We'd flip it, sell it, and then move on to the next. And we were able to do that a bunch of times. And so we actually rolled all of the cash that we earned into multiple other projects. Then we got in and we're excited about doing fix and flips. And then the market tanked right in the middle. We had 18 properties in construction at the same time. I think they call that, what's that over leveraged. So yeah, so that was bad. And I ended up giving, I think it was eight mortgages back to the bank. And you know, in the 2009, you know, recession and gave those back to the bank, walked away and said, all right, like that was obviously I did that wrong. And from there I started building online businesses and you know, then it was another book. What am I going to do? And I'm reading, you know, Tim Ferriss's book in 2008, you know, uh, four hour work week. And I go, well, that sounds better than getting my butt kicked in real estate. And so I, uh, I built an e-commerce business and it did well, but that's when I started using virtual assistants to do fulfillment and, you know, and everything behind the scenes. And so that was kind of my first touch into the digital world plus virtual assistants. And that just kind of exploded from there, right? Yeah, it kind of went nuts from there. So I had, uh, I did well with the e-commerce business. That that went well until the FDA decided they didn't like the homeopathic product that I was selling, which I guess I could have guessed that ahead of time. But I mean, I got to experience kind of how that was going to play out with, you know, you can't run ads on Google for that. You can't run Facebook ads for that. You can't, you know, all of a sudden credit card processing they shut that off for different products. If you know, and you start to understand kind of how all those games work. And then you realize like where you have to stay in your lane. And so that led me into people asking, well, how'd you end up selling, you know, how'd you market and advertise and do all those things to, to do well with the product. So that took me down the rabbit hole of marketing. And then, you know, I got to do some projects with Keller Williams, uh, their corporate office in Austin, Texas. So that was cool. Their training company that they had. And then the whole time in the background, without me realizing how unbelievable it would be long-term, I'm using virtual assistants the entire way and not knowing that that would be the thing that would catapult my financial and my freedom. So did you just move all your eggs, maybe not all your eggs, but a lot of your resources into the virtual side of this industry? So the way that I did it, I was, you know, I was trying to get help because I didn't have any money. And even, you know, when the e-commerce business did well, it's like, okay, great. This is all awesome. But I was really doing the, the Tim Ferriss lifestyle thing. You know, I went and I spent a bunch of time in Costa Rica and I was traveling around the country and spending time with friends and I was kind of all over and I really was much like a nomad. I didn't really have a home address. I was kind of all over, but I literally didn't have to work. And the e-commerce business ran itself and I had a shipping you know, company that shipped the product out and you know, we had a, a, a company manufacturing the product and everything was literally out of the book and it worked. And then everything on the back end was run by virtual assistants and it worked like clockwork. Then when that business ended up closing, I ended up getting into the marketing industry and that worked fine because I could use virtual assistants to do so much of the fulfillment and everything that, you know, even client facing stuff. Well, then somehow down the line, I don't know if I got wrapped up in the Gary V world or something, but I decided that I was going to open a US based office, you know, and it needed to be fancy because it had to have glass doors and glass walls and a big conference room and that whole stuff. And I hired 27 US employees and everybody has these fancy computers and we got camera equipment and we're running an agency doing everything for every business from shooting commercials to building websites to running ads. Then you lose a couple key clients and all of a sudden we don't have any money. Everybody's getting paid except me. And so that was a huge downfall. And again, I still had virtual assistants in the background supporting all these US employees. A lot of things came to realization on understanding how to hire for specialization rather than somebody who's kind of general. And one of the areas that became key for me was realizing that if you're local, like let's say, I mean, now a great example would be me. I'm in you know, the Bozeman, Montana area. If I wanted to build a company and have all of the talent in one place, my options are very limited. 
you know, our valley, there's barely over 100,000 people in the entire valley where we live, which encompasses many towns. So for me to get the greatest talent for one specific skill set, I'm not going to get it just here. Outsourcing it was huge and realizing I can get somebody with a master's degree in the Philippines and they can be the one to work in the business. And so that was a big realization for me. I want to hit the pause button. I'm going to jump in. I want to take it back a little bit. So you've had a lot of companies. We've tried a lot of things. We've kind of a big learning lesson, you know, the door-to-door sales thing. Then you had the, the, the bust of the Great Recession in 2008. So you've got a lot of wisdom, my friend. <laughs> I'm an old soul. <laughs> <laughs> so looking back, what would be one or two things you would say I would do differently knowing what I know today? Don't spend money on dumb things. And what I mean by that, it's not necessarily like I was never like a watch guy or a car guy. I've never been into that kind of stuff. But like watch, you know, how you reinvest your money back into your business. You know, everybody will say dump everything you can back into your business and grow that thing. I'm like, eh, take some out and be smart with it. You know, I look back and realize if I had half a brain in the, the recession, I would have been buying the whole way down. And what I wouldn't have been doing was sitting in these fix and flips and getting stuck in a bunch of these, you know, projects when the market's hot and high, but I was young, I was in my twenties, I was kind of stupid. And I was kind of riding, you know, in hindsight, I look back and go, well, how much money did I really put into that entire game? Well, it was the first couple deposits on a couple new construction projects. Then we rolled all the equity into these other projects. I had no real money in the game. So when I lost everything, did I really lose anything? Well, no, I lost the fictitious money that was equity in the market, but I was also pretty stupid because I should have grabbed a ton of that, put some away, and then my 30s, I wouldn't have been you know, broke and starting over again. You know, I would have been in a much different situation. So I would say understand finances as far as how to invest properly from the beginning. If you can understand how to reinvest back in your business, but also remember you know, 401ks aren't the best anymore. You know, there are no pensions for people. So prepare now, make good investments that for the long term, while you're building your business, because your business very well could fail. I've had lots of failed businesses <laughs> before I had any success. It's always going to take money up the table throughout the journey. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. But you did some good things too, because you learned, I mean, you learned. So what have maybe you said one key thing is, you know, talk about a couple of key things. Let's talk about that. A couple of key things that you did right. What did I do right? Oh, I never stopped trying. So the concept of failing fast, I am a firm believer in that. Well, I know that I can because I've done it so many times. I can fail on something much faster than most people can start something. I can take a concept like we're launching a business right now. We've already failed in that one two or three times. But now we just, because of those failures, we figured out what works and how we can move forward with it. And now we have revenue coming in and we're like, okay, now this is a real thing, right? Now we can actually grow this into something successful. But I think the fear of failing, people look at it incorrectly and part of it's, you know, school being brought up and you fail on a test and that's a bad thing and you get a bad grade and and all that stuff. And now that I have children, I'm actually watching that happen in real time where my daughter's a little fearful of not doing right in school and I'm like, Come on, let's go. Like, let's make, you know, make your mistakes and get them out. And, and I realized that it's challenging. We've been conditioned for that. So I think failing fast, failing often, going and trying things and never being fearful is unbelievably valuable in an entrepreneur's journey. And I think that I've been very, very good at allowing myself to go mess up and come back and go, okay, well, what can I take from that? And how can we then very quickly move forward and make an improvement? You know, I love, I love the concept of failing fast. If you take that, you know, you're in, you're out, or, you're, or, or it's going to be a win. But if you drag that thing out, it'll just drain you, not only emotionally, financially. And in one of the areas that we've been able to, I think that I've set my team up well, is now, because we've gotten so much better with finances over the past 10, 15 years, it's been, okay, great, we're going to make this test. We're going to try. And we're going to see what we can make come out of this. And here's our budget. And guess what? If we lose and our estimation is we are going to lose 100% of that, okay, we're going into it knowing that money's never coming back. Now, if it comes back and it comes back with a return, now we're onto something. 
But understanding we're going in, we're a budget, this money will not affect anything. It doesn't affect operations. It doesn't affect payroll. It doesn't affect my financial life at home. We're going to make this investment. We're going to take a test and we're going to see where we can go. And if we can't make it work with this, then we can reassess and say, do we need more resources? Can we afford to take this a step further? You know, taking those assessments and then finding out what you really get out of something. Yeah, I love that. Allocating resources to that. Uh, so, and then giving the freedom to fail. If you don't fail, the other side is victory. So, fantastic. All right, so I want to take a commercial break here, Joe. You have a handful of companies. So this is free reign for you. So let our listeners know what you want them to know, promote what you want to promote, and uh, maybe so they can get a sense of if they want to do business with you. You know, for entrepreneurs, I think the business that we represent the most effectively is level nine virtual, which is on my hat. It's on the thing level nine virtual. So it's level number nine virtual.com virtual assistant services. This is how all of my companies are operated. My team of virtual assistants run the show. They run everything. If you reach out, you're not going to connect with me. You're going to connect with my team. You know, my role in the company now is as a strategic advisor and I'm an investor. And so I get to guide the company where it needs to go for us to reach the goals that we have but I'm not actually in the day-to-day operations. We have people who do that. And again, 99% of them are in the Philippines. Well, I should say the Philippines and South America. So that company, we offer tons of services for small businesses. It can be something as simple as helping you with copywriting, web development. We do project-based work. Like if you need some graphic design work done, video editing, podcast work done, kind of anything, CRM setup and marketing automation tool. We build all of that. We can do it on a project basis. You just buy a block of hours. You can buy 40 hours or 25 hours. You can use them over an entire month. It's affordable for every single small business that's out there. So that's like similar to like an Upwork, except all of the projects that we do, we've done thousands of times. So you're getting people who are experts at what we're actually offering. We also offer dedicated virtual assistants. So you can have somebody work directly in your business. Say, hey, I need somebody who can be run Facebook ads for me in my business. We can place somebody specific for that. And then the other really core offer that we have is what we call live lead nurture, which is we're a call center answering inbound messaging for small businesses. Somebody texts into your business, they email in, they call in. We're there to answer in real time every single day of the week. What would you say is the the big hurdle for our listeners who own companies uh, about using the virtual world? Are we over are we over that now? Are we over that? I think that we're still stuck in an idea that if we're outsourcing, that means we're getting lower quality work done rather than if I hired somebody local, then they've got to be better because they're here in person. And I think that's a huge misnomer. You know, I, I like to always talk about my lead developer Sonny. He's got a master's degree and he is a professor at the university and I'm a college dropout. And like, I can hire people with more education, more experience and more expertise than I could ever provide somebody local, just anywhere in the US really, for a fraction of the cost. And so the cost leverage with outsourcing is amazing, but I think that people are still stuck in the mindset that they are a little bit fearful that outsourcing means lower quality. Mm. And that's just not the case. And in fact, a lot of times you can have way better quality, better speed. You can have it done while you're sleeping. Like it's pretty awesome. Yeah, but how do you manage these people? You can't see them. How, how, are they working for you? How do you know they're doing that? Oh, we monitor everything. So we do time tracking. We know when they're on, when they're off, which projects they're on because you know the time tracking works within our project management software. So we know what they're doing. We know if they're on idle time, meaning that they're not using anything on their computer, that the time is idle. So we can actually monitor that. Plus then we also, you know, a lot of these, these systems have screenshots. And so they'll take screenshots periodically over what they're working on. So we could go back and if there was ever a question, we could say, well, no, let's go check and see what they've been working on and we can go look at it. Luckily, you know, we have a fantastic HR team and we have a great staff. Our team comes to work with us because they want careers. They want to work in our company. They want to provide value. So very rarely do we have to deal with anything like that. But when we do, we have everything backed up. You know, I think you're a great solution for, first of all, people who've never been in the virtual world, uh, you, you're going to help them because, you know, you've ironed out all the, all the concerns and mistakes. You are leveraging expertise like nobody else. I think it's fantastic. If you go to one company, maybe they provide you 
strictly administrative help. That's it. That's all I got. I mean, but you need six things done, and you have a whole virtual team behind you that you could bring expertise in every one of those disciplines. That's one of the reasons that we created our what we call our pods, which is projects on demand. And it's similar to like an Upwork. You know, you can have a plethora of things. If you walk into your work in the morning and you open your computer and you're like, oh my gosh, I've got this to get done, that has to get done, that has to get done, and all these things. And as an entrepreneur, what do we do? We'll stay up all night long to execute. And that's great to a degree. But as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, our job is to make the company grow. It's to expand our opportunity for our company so that all the people you employ, all the people that you contract with, they can have success too, but they can't have success unless you're growing and you know continuing to thrive. I like the business owner to be the one who's responsible for revenue growth, mm-hmm. right? Whether you're absentee or not, your job is to oversee that sales. If you're not growing revenue, somebody in the organization is gonna feel it. And so what's great is that with leveraging project-based work or even hiring dedicated virtual assistants, you can get so many things off your plate that free you up to actually go execute revenue generating tasks. Cause that's where we should be focused is making more revenue. I love it. I'm a firm believer in the virtual world. I've been using virtual assistants for about eight years and, and uh, but I love what you're doing cause you're packaging it all up and, uh, and uh, exactly uh, you're a great service to people who are listening today. All right, I'm going to switch gears. Whether you're virtual or not, or you have everybody sitting in that fancy office you had with the, with the glass doors and all the, you know, the, <laughs> the skyline, you got a chance to look out in the high rent you had to pay, uh, you have to still navigate trying times. You've been through a couple of times yourself, especially in the real estate world. Um, but 2022 is over, but we got the hangover of 2022. We still have labor issues. We still have high interest rates going up, inflation. You know, political unrest, wars, you know, you name it, we got them all happening still. That's not, that's not behind us. So how are you, uh, as a leader, navigating your company? Do you see it as a time to invest, time to retreat, time to uh, open up new companies? Uh, how are you seeing this and how are you navigating it as a founder and CEO of your company is the first question. And the second question is, you have to get up on Monday morning, you got to leave the charge. So what are you doing for, for self-care? And you use mentors and disciplines and to keep yourself focused. Yeah. Okay. So from the company standpoint, it's realizing that everything is kind of working on a pendulum. And I think that we go from one extreme to the other. We're at one extreme right now, politically, globally, economically, we're completely swung all the way out to one side. It needs to come back. Now, a lot of people get hurt when these economic times shift and I did previously. So I understand I was actually, you know, luckily I I can say like I've, I've been through one of them and I've got hurt pretty good financially. Now it's a matter of preparing. Like, do you have resources? If the worst thing that you could think of happened, do you have resources? And for a lot of people just starting a business, they may not have resources. So my focus to them would be go sell. Like, you know, in most business circumstances, what's very interesting is revenue solves almost all problems, right? So no matter how anything breaks down, the one way you can usually solve the problem is by figuring out a way to invest more, invest differently, whether that be human capital, whether it's labor, whether it's actual finances, or even just your own time and attention, finding a way to leverage the resources that you have within your business to increase your revenue, I think is vitally important right now as we're in this time. So for me, what we're focused on is we're focused on sales. We're focused on pivoting if we have to in a direction that's going to match the needs in the market. So for example, our project on demand service, you know, we were virtual assistants, just dedicated virtual assistants. You could hire one VA, you could hire two VAs. That was it. We didn't have anything else. Well, then COVID hit and all of a sudden, you know, the business was doing very, very well. And all of a sudden we watched revenue just plummet. Well, what happened? All of our clients, their clients were canceling and it was a trickle down effect. And I went, Whoa, hold on. How do we fix this? They still have needs. They don't want to shut their business down. We need to provide a value for them. So we said, well, okay, let's figure out something we could do at a lower cost. That'll solve some of their problems. And so we created our, our pod service, our projects on demand, the business exploded. 
And all it was, was we matched the need of the market. Every single person who's running a business, your clients, your customers need something. The problem is are most people going to sit back and go, well, I'm going to do things that I always do. I'm going to do things my way and I'm not going to make a change and I'm not going to improve to match what the market is demanding. And that is a huge, huge mistake. So that's what I would say is start focusing on what the market needs now, but also look six months ahead, look a year ahead. What are they going to need then? Because as you know, especially for like, our, you know, us in the staffing world, businesses are laying people off by the thousands. So what are they going to need? Outsourced labor, lower cost labor. We can provide that. So our opportunity is gigantic when the economy starts to collapse. As companies grow and the economy's good, our demand goes up as well. And so we're kind of in this unique world. So how can you take whatever it is that you do and provide a value so that when the economy's good or the economy's bad, you're in need? So that would be one of the first things that I would say. Yeah. All right, so focus on sales and also be flexible to pivot. Look at the needs, adjust your company accordingly to meet those needs. Make sure that it can kind of ride the economy up and down. As far as, you know, your question was, how do I, what do I do? Get up in the morning, mentors. I listen to probably two audiobooks a week. I'm trying to continue to consume content that can make me better, whatever that might be. A lot of times you get a book and the book sucks and oh well. There's usually something you can pull out of it. I've been doing this thing where I actually listen to the audiobook and I read it at the same time. And I read it on an iPad. And what that does is it increases comprehension. And so you can listen to it at a faster pace than you can actually read, but because you're hearing it, you can follow. I want to give somebody credit for this, and I can't remember where I saw it. But one thing that they said is out of every chapter you read, write down an action item that you're going to take out of that chapter and start executing on that, right? Most of us all consume content whether it's videos on social media, whether it's a YouTube video, you know, we're watching some marketing stuff or we, we read a book and then it's like, I'm gonna, oh my God, I'm gonna go do all these things. You know, you're not, nobody does, right? We take the book, we put it up on the shelf and then we just in increase our library. You know, my wife makes me get rid of books. I'm like, no, no, we can't. I'll hide them in the garage, but no, we're not getting rid of them. But what I started doing was writing down one action item that I could take out of a single chapter and then I have to go execute it immediately. And that has been very, very helpful because I'm actually consuming, I'm getting something out of each chapter and now I have something to go do with it. Do you use mentors? I do. Whether they know they're my mentor or they don't, I do. I have somebody who's just a good friend. He's wildly successful. And every time I'm around the guy, I just constantly pick his brain. He's taught me a lot about how to really like back into real estate deals and get into some projects. He's a mentor. He doesn't know that he's mentoring me, but he's definitely mentoring me. On the flip side, you know, I have other mentors that they know when I call, I'm calling them because they're going to guide me. And we've developed that relationship over time. So I heavily believe in mentors. I do mentor some people. I also do a little bit of coaching as well with just a few clients a year. I think that in the beginning stages, as you're building your business, Paying to gain knowledge and to basically like speed through some of the mistakes that you would have to go make on your own to figure it out. Paying to get through them faster is fantastic. I've paid tons and tons of money for coaches because I firmly believe if they can give me a nugget that'll speed up my, you know, my progress, it's worth every penny. So it sounds like you're obviously a you're, you're learned person by your, and you also like to collect wisdom as you go along the way. And now you're at that time in life you can share it by being honest. There we go. I hope I'm providing some value to somebody. Uh, if, if people are not getting value, it's, it's on them. Not <laughs> yeah, on them. there you go. I like it. For, pe for people like yourself who are very busy taking time out of your day to share your knowledge and wisdom, uh, that's a gift. To Absolutely. Listeners, anybody who would like to listen in on different podcasts. So, Joe, how do they get a hold of you? Should they want to do business with you? Sure. Go to level9virtual.com level number nine virtual.com. You can book a call right there. Unfortunately, you will not chat with me specifically, but if you do want to reach out with me, it's very easy. Joe, J O E at level nine virtual.com. Joe, thanks for uh, being on the show. Seriously. My pleasure. I'm really grateful for you taking time on your busy day to share your wisdom with our listeners.